Good evening and welcome. Thank you all for coming to this workshop on fire and we have quite an array of experts here. I'm Cindy Fake and I'm the County Director for Nevada and Placer County Cooperative Extension and mostly I'm here to just to say welcome and thank you for coming and introduce you to Kate Wilkin. I know she's been doing quite a bit of work here in the last few months as she's been here so she's probably met a number of you but she is our new forestry and fire advisor. She serves Sutter, Yuba, Butte, and Nevada County. So um, she has a wide range of uh, <laughs> areas, but she's got a lot of knowledge about fire. Um, and she actually lives in Nevada County. So she's one of you too. Um, and so I'll turn it over to her now. And thank you for coming. Thank you, Cindy. And before I start, I just want to start uh, passing around a sign-in sheet so you all can help us um, understand who came this evening. So thank you all for coming to our workshop on fire-adapted communities um, and how to make your homes and lands more resilient to fire. Today we're going to discuss how to overcome this wildfire crisis that we have here in California. I know that many of you all have heard in the news that people think this is the new normal for California even though this was an unprecedented year for wildfire loss. Um, but as a fire scientist, I believe that there are many things that we can do to change that narrative, especially here at home in Nevada County. And so today we're going to discuss how to overcome this wildfire crisis. Um, even though we have longer and drier fire seasons, I know, and the effects of fire suppression and poor land use planning are kind of catching up with us, there's still many proactive measures that we can take. Especially in this region, we can choose how we want to interact with fire. You know, do we want to be run out of our homes or do we want to take proactive measurements to make our homes resilient to fire or resistant to fire? Create community-wide fuel breaks and also do landscape-wide forest resiliency treatments to fire so that fires can't get as catastrophic. And these are all things working with many of the professionals here in this room that I'll be working on as your forest and fire advisor in UC Cooperative Extension. And so our goal tonight is to help people here in Nevada County and nearby um, understand the vision of how to make sure that their families, homes, and communities are resilient to fire, set a vision, and then also to connect you to resources here. And so tonight we have many, or nearly all of these resources from Nevada County here. We have the Fire Safe Council with Joanne Drummond. We have local registered for foresters like Dario Davidson. We have contractors like Franz Tyson. We have a UC expert, Steve Quarles. We also have uh, professionals from the National Resource Conservation Service, the Resource Conservation Districts, and many others like USDA Rural Development to help you all understand how you can plan for the future with these state and federal resources. And so our panel tonight is gonna help set a vision of how to become resilient to fire. And then after they finish their talks and their discussion here, we'll retire to the main lobby where you all can interact with many of these professionals to come up with your own plan of how you want to act differently and how you want to enact this change. And during that time, we also have a few snacks for you in case you have a little bit of low blood sugar. There's cookies and fruit and coffee and tea in the lobby for you. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first panelist. We have Dr. Steve Quarles. He was a UC researcher and he retired and now he works for the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. He is one of the He's a world-renowned researcher in how to design and build homes to be, become resilient or resistant to fire. Thanks. Okay, thanks so much, uh, Kate, for the invitation to be here. And um, so how do I do this? the wrong one. I should have my joke now. <laughs> okay, here we go. So I like not sitting behind the desk when I'm talking, so um, that's me. Um, and thanks again for the uh, opportunity to be here. I've been here a number of times in the past, um, but not since I'm um, this other guy here with this other company. Um, but 
I'm here to talk about the built environment, your home, and how, how it's vulnerable to wildfires and things you can do to uh, make it less vulnerable to wildfires. So the one thing that we know from a number of post-fire assessments and research and, and just observing fires in the past is that the windblown ember or firebrand is really important. It's the most important thing um, when it comes to uh, causes of home ignition. And you can um, sort of see that in this picture. This is the Angora fire in 2007. Um, and the import important thing to, to know here, it's just not so clear in this particular picture, unfortunately, is that there's a burn a burned down house here in amongst a lot of green vegetation around it. So the wildfire didn't burn to the building. Embers from that wildfire landed on, in, around the house, ignited the house. And so a lot of research uh, lately has been on exactly how uh, homes are, are vulnerable to embers and then things that can be done to the home to help it resist that ember exposure. Um, so there's a couple of things when they talk about uh, the, the way that embers ignite homes and, and I break them down into two parts. One is direct ember ignition, the other one is an indirect ignition. So this picture here to the left is our lab in South Carolina that can generate these ember storms. Um, we can put full-size buildings into this, into this wind tunnel facility so we can really understand what embers do around the house. Um, and then the right-hand pictures are direct and indirect. So this is a, a wood deck and embers ignited the wood deck directly. So it didn't matter about vegetation, um, it just, it can ignite um, the thing directly without any help from other other combustibles around. So a wood shake roof is an example of, of how embers can directly ignite something. It can directly ignite that wood shake roof. It can directly ignite this wooden deck. <clears throat> and this lower right-hand picture is an example of it indirect. So indirect means that the embers ignited, in this case, bark mulch next to the building, and then that resulted in a flaming exposure to the side of the building. So that's an, an example of an indirect ember exposure. And then if you have a neighbor that's close by or you have a, a firewood pile that's, that's close by, embers ignite the firewood pile, for example, you can end up with a, an extended radiant heat exposure. That's the other kind of exposure that we need, really need to be worried about. And this is an Eastern Tennessee fire in 2012. Um, this home ignited that home. And this particular right-hand picture is just several minutes later. It's the same building here, but several minutes later. And in this case, radiant energy broke a, a glass in a window, um, fire got in that way, and then burned the house. So a couple of, of examples of indirect ignition. Um, before we get too far along, if you can just click the go button on this thing. Down. Maybe just click on it. Yeah, there you go. So the, I'm going to stop this some at some point because it's, it's a little bit long, but this is just showing you what embers can do. So uh, embers uh, um, lodging against a window screen. Pretty soon you've seen that bark mulch next to the building being ignited. Bark mulch, I mean pine needle in, uh, in gutter being ignited. Um, vinyl gutter falls to the ground. Metal gutter on the right stays put. So it becomes an edge of the roof problem versus an on the ground problem. Um, pine needle debris on the roof ignited by embers. So embers can easily ignite this finer fuels, pine needles, bark mulch. Um, and then um, this house is turning. So it looks like it's turning because it is. Um, this is a, sort of a rerun. Um, again, vinyl gutters. Um, to, uh, they fall to the ground eventually and usually pretty quickly. Um, and then this is a fire in an, in, in an, in an interior corner. So um, all because of embers that ignited mulch at the bo bottom of the, at the base of the wall and then ignited uh, debris and gutters. So the, the key is to keep, keep debris out of the gutter. We advocate for a non-combustible zone right next to the house just because of the power of the ember. Um, should be inside. So this screen did really well. It was a, a, a fiberglass kind of a screen. It did really well until flames touched it. So it did a good job keeping embers out. 
until the flames touch it. That's another reason for having this non-combustible zone. This is another sort of example, and I'm gonna stop it after this one, but again, easily igniting bark mulch, which then ignites, you'll see in a minute, um, uh, the siding. <coughs> Our video guy really likes slow motion, so you have to sort of deal with that. Flame getting underneath a, a plastic composite deck, and so you had sort of a bigger fire and on this landing, again, wrapping around into this interior corner. Um, okay, and this is sort of beyond, so if you can just stop it, and I'll go to the next slide. So, um, you, you saw examples of what embers can do, and we're gonna now start talking a little bit about things that you can do. Um, so, home survival, really, it's a coupled approach. So we call it a coupled approach because it depends on two things. Things you do on your property with regard to vegetation and other combustibles, and things you do to your home in terms of materials and design features. So I'm gonna focus, for the most part, on the home. We have other people here, Joanne and Dario, that are gonna focus on other, on the, on the, on the property, things you can do on the property. Um, but it's called a couple, I call it a coupled approach because this house survives because of things you do both to vegetation on the property and things you do to the home. And there's a couple of mitigation strategies that deal with that. And um, this is a home loss map from the Tubbs fire. So these red circles here are destroyed homes. Left-hand side, there's fairly uh, good distance between you and your neighbor and this is Coffee Park and not so much. And so we're gonna, I'm make, gonna make a, a distinction about the importance of certain things depending on, on your kind of scenario. Ugh. So let's start first with your neighbors far away. Um, in that case, really it's, it's largely up to you, um, but you need to create and maintain an effective de defensible space at things you do on your property and then you need to follow certain uh, installation uh, detailing when you put your home together. Um, and really these, these sort of design things are more important than the particular kind of material for the most part. The wood shake roof is, a, is, a different, is, a diff, is an exception to this, uh, but largely it's, it's details in terms of things you do to help your home resist an ember exposure. And the one, ex uh, the one exception, I'm, not, I'm gonna sort of deviate into vegetation kind of things and talk about the, the, the um, area right next to your house and underneath your deck. And it should be largely non-combustible, um, irrigated lawn tends to be okay, and non-woody vegetation is okay. But rock mulch, from a fire perspective, is an excellent thing. And making sure that your deck looks more like this upper center picture, which is rock mulch again, versus this lumber yard here under, in the, in, under the deck. It's really hard for any kind of a deck to resist uh, that kind of flaming exposure that would occur when embers uh, f got into the, this wood pile here and ignited it. And before the embers got there, uh, fine debris, pine needles and, and the like got there first. And so easily ignited, big fire, hard for any deck to resist. Your, that deck, your deck is attached to your house. Typically you have a way to get onto that deck, so a, a sliding glass door, and there's a big fire um, impinging on the side of your house when this happens. So make it look more like the center picture and less like this picture. So, but there's a lot of detail. So this is a class A roof but really the vulnerability of this class A roof is the edge of it, so you need to make sure that you block the edge so that embers cannot get underneath and bypass the effectiveness of the, of the class A roof. Um, this is, um, <clears throat> again, it's hard to see in this particular uh, slide, but this is a bird's nest underneath this non-combustible roof. So embers, em embers ignite that and then, ig and then ignite the structural materials that like the roof sheathing. <laughs> So you need to make sure you block this. You can, there are commercially available blocks, and this is a homemade job, though. This is just mortar mix that you might use uh, for brick, putting a brick home together. And they dyed it red, so it looks pretty nice. Uh, I caught this guy in action, so he was in process. So he wasn't like he stopped short and wasn't gonna do this. He just hadn't done it quite, quite yet. 
So that's one uh, example, gutter. Um, so you saw this in, in the video, vinyl gutters fall to the ground, metal gutters stay in place, but it's a edge of roof issue. You wanna keep debris out of your gutter. Uh, Non-combustible gutter covers can um, be effective in doing that. Um, so that's, that's one way. Thank you so much for this. I didn't think about that, but should have. Um, so I just sort of walk through these things. Uh, a, a metal drip edge at the roof edge is another really effective way to protect the edge of the roof. You may have a class A roof, but typically you're gonna have wood sheathing, I mean, uh, wood sheathing for the roof, and then wooden fascia board at that, that roof to uh, um, edge of roof detail. So, yike. Okay, that's good. Uh, there are a number of uh, types of vents. Fine mesh screen is a way to keep embers from out of your attic and crawl space. There are a number of California approved um, uh, vents that we can talk about, and I think uh, Franz will talk about a little bit more, but there's four now that have been approved for use in the state of California that are flame and ember resistant. Uh, grounds, the, the roof, so this is an example of the siding thing. So I don't worry so much about, in this case, the, 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 the wood siding. I worry more about whether embers can accumulate at the base of the wall. So this is a good detail when you have clearance between the, uh, the ground and the start of the siding with a non-combustible foundation. We know that, that embers accumulating against the siding will ignite that siding, so you wanna make sure you have this clearance. Uh, same for the, uh, for the roof to wall. Uh, you can use metal flashing up here. You can replace the siding locally with a non-combustible in this area because that clearance is, is not so good. You can keep debris off of the roof in that location in these sort of complex areas. Yike. Um, so moving on just to uh, you have a close by neighbor. In this case, you still need to have this effective, effective def defensible space. Um, you really then now materials become much more important in terms of non-combustible or ignition resistant kind of materials. And this is just a tempered glass window that also becomes important. So you need to be pay more attention to that. Uh, those kind of things. And details are important because you still need to resist the ember, but you need to be ready for other kinds of exposures, such as a ra extended radiant heat. Um, we can talk about this later. Um, this just is a study we did after an Eastern Tennessee fire, just looking at um, uh, home to home distances to determine what that maximum home spacing could be. And sort of if, if your neighbor is within say 25 feet, then you, can, you need to be worried about radiant heat. So just to summarize, we have this, these kind of different exposures, the direct and indirect when it comes to ember ignition. And then uh, this coupled approach, vegetation management, selection, placement, maintenance is really critical. And then the kind of materials you, you choose and then how they are installed is really important from an ember, ember exposure in particular. And this acknowledging that that um, you can have wildland fire to home ignition scenarios, and if you have close by neighbors, then you can also have home to home as, as part of uh, things you need to be um, designing for and building for. A lot of these things are pretty inexpensive to do, um, and depending on how handy you are in particular, but the maintenance kind of things, clearly you can do, I think, um, like uh, cl clearing gutters and the like. So let's see. That's it. How's that? So yeah. So this is this is our lab. It's a pretty cool lab. If you haven't seen it, if you go to this uh, website, we have some cool videos and a lot of I think useful information, which happens to be on the table out there, also. So thanks very much, and we'll do questions later. I'm thinking. Well, we can take a few questions now, um, but because we're filming this, I'm going to run the microphone out to you if you have a question. Just wondering, if, which is better to have or in your backyard or around your house, gravel or grass? Around your house? Yeah. Gravel. Better than grass? Green irrigated grass? Mm -hmm. Yes. Next to your, really close to your house. Beyond, grass is fine. Uh, 
The material that, that people put around the bottom of their decks, the surrounds, the lattice work, wood lattice or wire, would you, I mean, I think, I'm thinking the obvious thing is to have wire as opposed to the lattice. Would that be correct? That would be correct. Lattice is kind of uh, lighter fuel. Yeah. Is there any particular size of wire that you recommend or, if, like, you know, the whole size or? So um, th that's sort of a, an enclosure thing. Um, and I think it's more of a, the answer to that question is really a function of what are you storing under your deck. And if you don't have combustibles to speak of, then it is more a visual thing and you can choose the, the wire that, that is attractive to you. But if you're storing materials under your deck, um, then you know you have to sort of worry about more than, um, than the wire size. Right. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Would you have any artful ideas on how to initiate a conversation with a neighbor who has piles of combustibles? Um, so I would um, start with an invitation to happy hour, something at your house. Um, and just start talking about, politely talking about wildfire and you know, maybe point out what you've done and why, and then um, talk about, this would be on the, on the second glass. Um, <laughs> I, and I, you just have to get there, and I'm not necessarily the most tactful person, but um, you know, I, I think it's, it's a way in, talk about what you've done, and then your concern about about the, the neighboring property, your, this neighbor's property. Are those test uh, videos that you showed, are they accessible on the net to the public? Yes, sir. Um, they're online. Um, Is that the uh, disaster.org uh, slash wildfire site? Okay. Um, but Kate has them and, and she's willing to share them. <laughs> So thank you all for those great questions. I think um, because of our timing, we'll move on to the next panelist, and then we can take more questions at the end of the panel about this. Does that sound good? Thanks okay. very much. Great. Thank you, Steve. That was great. Our next panelist is Franz Veltyson. He is a contractor with Quality and Quantity Construction. Um, and he focuses a lot on home retro retrofits to, to how you can improve your home survivability and how, how can you make your home more fire resistant after it's already been built. Because I suspect many people in here already have a home and it has some you know, somewhat archaic uh, codes on it because it was built in the 80s or 90s or even the early 2000s. And so he has some really great innovative ideas about how you can make these changes to your pre-existing home. So Franz? Well, first let's see how this works. Okay. Good evening. My name is Franz Feldhuysen, Quality and Quantity Construction. Thank you for inviting me, uh, Kate and Joanne and Steve, for making this all possible. Um, so my main concern is how can we live sustainably in the place we live. If we don't make our homes fire resistant, we will not be able to continue to live in this beautiful environment where we chose to live. The reason mostly is if we live on these smaller lots where we originally had rural agricultural 40 acre zoning now going down to one acre and we create this defensible space around our home, there isn't much nature left, especially now when second units aren't allowed for um, low-cost housing initiatives. You have to create this defensible space around both units. There isn't a tree left if you do that, if you exaggerate doing that. I'm not saying don't do it, 
we need the defensible space, but we'll see later on <coughs> why we can be very selective in doing that. So <coughs> my motto is focus on making your home fire resistance. If we don't, we will cut so much of our nature that Banner Mountain, for example, where we live, will become Bald Mountain or as real estate people call it, nice horse property. <laughs> so, the most important reason, as Steve already mentioned, the vast majority of homes that burn due to a wildfire are ignited by embers coming in. So what is this defensible space really doing? It's not that fire, that crown fire that we're all so afraid of, that comes raging to your house and then engulfs your house and sets it on fire. It's the embers blowing in from a long distance away. And because your home is not fire resistant, it will set your house on fire. The defensible space becomes now critically important because your house will set the trees on fire if you don't have enough distance between your house and the trees. So to prevent your house from becoming a new spot fire, and, and as we just saw on the previous slides, setting your neighbor's house on fire, it's critically important to make your home fire resistant. Here's some same examples. I don't want to overlap too much. Amber storms. These are the things <clears throat> around the home, the things around your home that caught on fire, but these charred em uh, pieces of wood are closer to the, are aiming at the house. So the house is what charred those things, not the surrounding trees. The same examples here. So the firebrands blowing in, what causes the home to ignite is the radiant heat. So if you have a crown fire nearby, the radiant heat can set your house on fire. It can crack your windows. The heat will shatter your glazing if you don't have tempered glass, which is now the new current code. But all these older existing homes, they still have the regular glass. <clears throat> so what most people don't tell you is that the defensible space is not to defense your home but it is to allow your home to burn down safely. <laughs> because that's what happens. Now, is it possible to make your home fireproof? I don't know. But it's definitely possible to improve the fire resistance of your home to such a point that it has a really good chance of surviving a fire, especially if you have the defensible space. So here are more studies of how they measure intensity of fire. <clears throat> There's another example that's of a home that survived. <clears throat> oh, let's see, fire resistance. Okay, so there are three ways to make your home more fire resistant. One is passive. It is based on the structural components and the details of your house. The roofs, as we just all identified before. Then there is an active way, which is preventing ignition by sprinkler systems, hosing it down. Uh, there are some disadvantages to those because when a fire is in your neighborhood, a lot of the time the power goes down. A lot of the time there's no water available, not until the fire people arrive with their fire trucks and uh, their own water supply. And by the way, those fire people with their trucks and equipment are not near your house. They're where the fire line is. They're fighting that fire. So when these embers blow in and they set your house on fire, they're not there. Then there is another possibility that some people have been uh, promoting homeowner applied gels and of course fire insurance policy. 
to me, homeowner applied gels are, I don't know, they are probably effective, but if you are on an evacuation advisory and then you get an evacuation warning and now you're all ready to go, I think you'll be packing your valuables and you're not going to your garage to dig out this gel and then look at the expiration date on the can. <laughs> so I, my, my specialty is the passive part, making the structure fire resistance. Um, we just uh, talked about this. New construction, building codes take care of that pretty much. Uh, your home from the top down. Starting at the roof, the class A fire aided. And as Steve mentioned, it's uh, the devil is in the details. You have skylights, chimneys, roof hatches. If they become too big, Embers can accumulate on the high side of a, uh, or a skylight or a chimney. And if they don't have the proper flashing details, that can be a big problem. Um, if you have a low slope roof, especially the valleys, uh, there's danger that fire can get under the shingles. Um, the lower roof edge can catch on fire. So. I have some examples coming up of what we can do about it. The skylights. If you have a tempered glass, I see a lot of these skylight bubbles. They are acrylic bubbles. They tend to shed the embers pretty well because of the shape. But if these embers accumulate on the high side of your skylight, they will melt that bubble, and now you have an opening in your roof. So replacing your acrylic skylights with tempered glass skylights would be a very good thing to do. Or to have some prepared hatches that if there is a fire and you know it's coming to your neighborhood, you may have time to put those protective covers over your skylights. Um, plumbing, roof penetrations, they have these rubber gaskets around them. If embers accumulate on the high side and they stick there, start burning, the rubber will melt, creating an opening into your attic. Those embers will fall into your attic. You can put a matter color around those. Um, intake fence, I have a table there with all kinds of examples of materials. That's an example there of um, a metal color that, um, over the rubber that is actually, uh, that is metal, and so this is a dual metal thing and it'll protect the rubber from fire, but also from sunlight. I've done a lot of work uh, repairing leaks, and people think they're roof leaks, but really that rubber cracks after 10 or 15, 20 years of exposure to the sun. If you have these little metal colors over it, it'll protect them and make them last longer. Uh, gutter covers. So this is a homeowner applied do-it-yourself. I have a sample there that was made available by Hills Flat Lumber. You can install them. They, up, uh, they, uh, where are we? There. They attach with little clips. They slide under your shingle. So, part of what uh, Steve just mentioned is that roof edge has plywood that overhangs your gutter. So if anything, fire catch, it can set the plywood on fire. These metal shields go under your shingles, so they will also cover your plywood and protect it that way. Eave vents. We're coming down from the roof now to the eaves. So, the eaves are very sensitive. If a fire leaps up along the wall, the heat accumulates underneath there. You have vents that will ventilate your attic space. The embers get sucked in there by applying a soffit board, like a, a fiber cement soffit board. You can prevent that from happening with the approved fence. Here the boards are installed. 
also, what we see here is uh, a fiber cement siding, which is uh, class A rated. This is a stucco wall, also cement, class A rated. Here are some examples of those vents, fire marshal approved vents. Uh, these, again, I have some from Hills Flat Lumber that they gave me to show here. Um, now, in some situations, it's very easy to replace those fence. You can just pop them out and put a new one in. In some cases, it's a little bit di more difficult. Here's a stucco building with um, a built-in gable vent. There is no vent available that I could find that would fit right in there. So instead, we went on the inside, on the attic. We used the one-eighth mesh, the metal mesh that is required and treated it with an intumescent paint. An intumescent paint is uh, just like a regular paint, only when you expose it to heat, it foams up and it closes all the holes. So if you don't have tempered glass, um, you can protect your windows, especially on the most exposed sides. I made some panels there that clip in so when you are ready to evacuate your home, you have to go to your basement or your garage and put those panels in place, which is a chore. And you have to make sure that you number them right and that you have them in the right order. But um, an, a lot easier way would be to have these uh, roll-up shutters that you can install. Um, make sure they're not plastic, but uh, aluminum. Um, there's a company locally, uh, uh, Environmental Systems, Daryl Halt, who installs these. I have some samples on my table. Um, now we're coming down to the foundation. Almost there, one more minute. Um, the foundation fence, same story, fire marshal approved fence. Sometimes when you have just standard siding, you can replace them easily if there is stucco Sometimes they're embedded and you can't get the old ones out. Again, put the intumescent treated fire mesh on there, uh, wire mesh on there. This is, an, I put my plumbing torch on it to show how it kind of foams up there. Um, and the transition from horizontal surfaces to vertical surfaces, um, you can put, instead of making your whole house uh, fire resistant, you can make a wainscoting on the base uh, with a stone veneer. Uh, stone decks, class A rated decks, that's a, actually a membrane, a cementitious acrylic membrane, class A rated, a ply deck, I have some samples there. These are stone pavers, deck stone, they're self-draining, uh, class A rated. And uh, I think attached structures, make sure that the wood fences and gates that are attached to your house have a non-combustible material for about three to six feet away from the house. Well, that's it. If you'd like to talk to me, I'll be there and I'll have a lot of examples of materials that I use. Thank you. Franz, thank you for sharing your experience with doing uh, wildfire resistant retrofits on the homes here in Nevada County. It's much appreciated. Do we have any questions in the audience for Franz? I have th that typical uh, one, and a one and a half inch a redwood lath, cr cross, cross hatch lath. Is there, it's a hard thing to say. Uh, is there a non-combustible version of that? Not that I'm aware of, but what I have been recommending and doing in certain situations, that actually you had a question about that wire mesh also. Um, I think if, maybe aesthetically not the nicest, but there is a product called Galvalum Corrugated Roofing, and I like to make a skirt under the deck and basically close the whole thing which serves a dual purpose. Uh, if you have a ground fire creeping, you know, gra fires, grasses, mulch burning, it'll stop that. 
And secondly, it will prevent the embers from blowing in. So, Can you name that again, please. Um, well, it's a, it's a corrugated roofing material, really, but most people like the galvalume. It looks like a galvanized metal. It's aesthetically pleasing, but you can get it in all colors. And available where? In local lumber yards. Okay, thank you. If you were replacing a deck, what kind of material would you recommend that's most fire resistant? Well, recommend and requirements, there's a difference. I think the building code allows for a class C rated deck. And I wish Steve would have shown you what that means. If you have a class C, it's a tiny little fire, a class B, would be resistant to a little bit of a fire. Class A, you can actually have something really burning and it would resist catching on fire. So I would recommend a class A rated deck. They are hard to find. Most decks available, the typical decking material, if you go, even the composites are all class C rated. There's a few class B rated ones and a very few class A rated ones. The class A rated ones are mostly not composites, they're PVC material, dense PVC, and, uh, or stone-like materials, like a, s a cement coating, like a waterproofing membrane and stuff like that. So I would think, or metal decking, there's another one, Versa deck, uh, an aluminum deck. Hey, thank you. Okay, thank you all. Our next panelist is Dario Davidson. He's a local registered professional forester, and he's gonna be talking about how we can treat the lands around our homes to make our forests healthier. I think we all recognize that California's forests are unhealthy. Have you all heard about the drought mortality? Have you seen it around here? Yeah, and so um, working with people like Dario becomes incredibly important um, when you want to make your forest healthier and more resilient to things like drought mortality and fire. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm gonna talk more about the history of vegetation change in the Sierra Nevada to understand how we got to where we are today. And in the last about 40 years, I've been living in the Northern Sierra Nevada, working as a forester, doing all kinds of different forestry projects from reforestation to timber harvesting, wildlife projects, fighting some wildfires, um, doing a lot of fuel reduction projects and many, many acres of prescribed burns and unfortunately spent many a night out trying to stop the prescribed burns when they got a little out of control. But um, uh, historical cultural changes are reflected across the landscape. So every time a different culture moves into a, a landscape, the whole landscape changes. And um, every culture views natural resources in a different light, and um, they, they act on that and create the changes across the landscape. So today we're faced with many, many questions about the Sierra Nevada forest. For instance, why are so many trees that have endured many previous droughts now dying by the millions? And why are fires becoming impossible to control at times? And the Little Hoover Commission in California just came out with a report um, on the condition of the Sierra Nevada forest. And here's a quote from the chair of the Little Hoover Commission. Quote, a century of mismanaging Sierra Nevada forests has brought an unprecedented environmental catastrophe that impacts all Californians. Now, in all fairness, there have been many good management practices, but they've been overshadowed by the dominant mismanagement, which more accurately is the lack of management altogether due to factors like budget shortfalls and endless expensive litigation. The chair of the Little Hoover Commission goes on to say that we now have, quote, a rare opportunity for transformational culture change in forest management practices. 
So here we go again, another culture change. So let's hope we get it right this time. Oops. So today our forests are in an unstable condition. Oh. They're so overcrowded that uh, the trees are just choking each other. They're no longer resilient to droughts and bark beetle attacks. And when they burn, they burn with such high intensity, they're difficult to control and burn at high intensity over large areas. <clears throat> and this type of condition never existed before in the history of the Sierra Nevada. This is a whole new ball game. And there's nothing natural about the state of our forest today. This is entirely a man-made condition. So first, we want to understand how we got to this, path, to this condition so we can have a more des uh, desirable condition. So fire played an important role throughout the history of the Sierra Nevada. And um, for thousands of years, fire shaped the Sierra Nevada vegetation. And plants and animals either adapted to fire or found isolated niches that could rarely burn. When humans first arrived here about 12,000 years ago, give or take a couple of weeks, they didn't bother to put out lightning fires. In fact, they modified the ecosystems by lighting their own fires, along with digging, tilling, and sowing to favor their favored native food plants. And ecological disturbance was important to the Native Americans because young succulent new plant growth is more nutritious and more useful to them and their prey animals than old woody dying vegetation or dense shady forests. So extensive research has determined that on average in our part of the Sierra Nevada, fires burned about every seven to 15 years. Uh, more often in some places, less often in others. And on the, on the right, we have a ponderosa pine with a fire scar. And the fire scar is formed when a hot fire burns the base of the tree. It kills part of the cambium. And then the tree has to regrow to heal that scar. And then the next fire that comes through does the same thing over and over. And on the left, we have a cross section of a tree with a fire scar. And you can see these lines going in. Each one of those represents a fire. So you can count the growth rings in between each of the scars and determine how many years between each fire. And this has been, this kind of research has been done all across the Western US. And um, so we've come up with a uh, average of seven to 15 years for a fire return interval. So periodic fire kept the forest more open allowing space for grasses, forbs, and patches of shrubs to grow. Some fires were unsuppressed lightning fires, while others were intentionally set by Native Americans to achieve their purposes. Here's a photo of an early Sierra forest, and it, it illustrates the openness of the forest. Lots of sunlight reaches the forest floor, and there's some grasses and forbs growing under there. There's a thin layer of organic matter on the ground, not a lot of logs and debris, and uh, a lack of ladder fuels, shade tolerant trees and shrubs. Also, it's kind of hard to see with this light, but most of these trees have fire scars on them. <clears throat> so, John Muir in his book, The Yosemite, he describes a typical forest as, quote, the woods dry and wholesome, letting in the light in shimmering masses of half sunshine, half shade. And half sunshine and half shade has become a rare sight in our forests today. In fact, many places you have to fight your way through a thicket of shade tolerant trees and shrubs to get through the forest. And um, what Muir saw was a managed landscape, primarily managed by fire periodic low to moderate intensity fires. Fires removed the accumulated fuels, killed encroaching tree and shrub seedlings, and favored plants adapted to fire, such as ponderosa pine. Well, things changed rapidly, and the culture changed with the onset of the gold rush. Many trees were cut, especially favored species like ponderosa pine, sugar pine, and Douglas fir, for building towns, mines, and flumes, Power and heat were generated with wood. Um, 
powering um, foundries, stamp mills, steam engines, and people burned wood that was the primary source of energy for cooking and heating. And many times these fires broke out and sometimes turned uh, Grass Valley, Nevada City into ashes. And herds of livestock ranged across the landscape to feed a growing population of immigrants, which kept the brush growth suppressed and maintained open forests and grasslands, but displaced the native grazing animals, which had a very important impact on controlling native vegetation. Orchards and farms were planted, were suitable, and a different type of management was taking place. Many plants were introduced accidentally or on purpose, and we're still living with the consequences of that today. And um, ranchers periodically burned in the fall to keep the grazing land open, uh, keeping the trees and shrubs from encroaching on the grassland. So the landscape was managed primarily for resource production at the time and was maintained in a much more open condition than today. But slowly, over time, the natural resource production declined with less ranching, less farming, less logging, and many, many more homes scattered out into subdivided parcels out in the woods with this regenerating, ever-thickening forest surrounding them. And many people like to keep a nice thick screen so they don't have to look at their neighbors tenth of a mile away um, so there's been less and less management on the forest and more and more thickening of the forest. And many poorly designed roads were snaked into parcels, many overgrown with shade tolerant vegetation and creating sh a sure fire trap. And fire suppression became very well organized, benefited from improving technology, um, protecting homes and lives, but effectively keeping fire from playing its role in the cleansing of the forest, of the fuel buildup. And when we're at this point of putting jumbo jets in the air to drop fire retardant, I just can't think of any technology that's going to take us any further than this. Um, in most areas, oops. in most areas, the trees are so crowded that they're they're stressed, easily stressed during minor droughts, and they're succumbing to bark beetles by the thousands or the millions. Uh, in the past, a mature forest had about 60 to 90 trees per acre. Today, typically, there's 300 to 600 trees an acre, and even 1,000 trees an acre in many places. So here's an important fact to remember. Um, with our productive soils and our Mediterranean climate, with cool, wet winters and warm, dry summers, the accumulation of biomass on the forest floor far exceeds the decomposition rate. Um, what that means is without periodic fire or in its place manual fuel reduction, the results include increasing fuel buildup, vegetation overcrowding, and a lack of resilience and diversity of Sierra Nevada ecosystems. And we have chosen to nestle our homes into this huge, ever-growing bed of fuel. So what should we do about it? Well, we need to have a new vision of what a healthy forest is. We need to move away from overprotection of, over protection of forests and realize that a mosaic, sorry, a mosaic creates the most resilient and diverse habitat. Uh, we must accept that periodic disturbance, such as forest thinning or control burning, and control grazing maintains a for forest in a healthy condition similar to the pre-gold rush condition. We need to strive for forest diversity and recognize that uh, the ecological value that openings provide in forests. And we need to move away from this dark, shady, overcrowded condition to more of this, we need to see much less of this and more of this. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done to return resilience to our forests. And when land management agencies propose projects across the landscape, we need to support them, even if there's a few parts of the project we're not happy with. And most importantly, 
we should all start to work in our own backyards. Thank you very much. Dario, thank you so much for sharing some of our ecological and human history of California and also those beautiful photographs of forests that are resilient to fire. Those were beautiful. Thank you for that. Do we have any questions? Uh, we've been talking about defensible space. Um, what kind of recommendation would you suggest for the number of trees in, let's say, uh, an area that's maybe 30 feet from a home? Okay, I think Joanne might be addressing this because there's some new standards for separation of trees, and I think it was... Well, I think there's a distinct difference between the minimum requirements under California Public Resource Code 4291 and some of the best available science coming out of the National Fire Protection Association's FireWise program. So on the table out there, we do have some of the FireWise uh, information as well. But within the first 30 feet of your structure, F California Public Resource Code 4291 requires a 10-foot crown separation, so branch to branch, between the trees within 30 feet, whereas the FireWise program recommends 18 feet of crown separation, so nearly double. So there is a little bit of a difference there in terms of what is being shown as the best available science versus the minimum requirements under the law. So let me just add just outside of the defensible space zone, just for a healthy forest, for mature trees, your trees should be at least 20 feet apart, more like 26, 28, from trunk to trunk to give them space to be healthy and, and <laughs> I'm curious about tree size and a tree's resistance to fire. You gave examples, but they were fairly large trees. Um, so can you speak to that, just th that people cut big trees um, if they have a choice between <laughs> cutting big trees and lots of the smaller fuel. Um, can you speak to that? Yes. The, the larger the tree under the same situation, the larger the tree, the more resistant it's going to be to fire. However, if it's crowded with a whole bunch of shade-tolerant trees under it forming a ladder, it doesn't matter that the big trees are going to go along with the small ones. So when you're trying to reduce the fire danger, you're primarily targeting the smaller trees, which are the more shade tolerant trees, which tend to be the most flammable trees, like incense cedar. Do you recommend grazing off the ground every year? Um, on a grassland, I would say you should graze it or mow it. Um, in the forest, we don't most places we don't have enough light reaching the forest floor to produce enough forage but if you opened up the forest like a couple of pictures I had you'd get more grass growth you get a lot more wildflowers much more diversity because of the extra sunlight coming in and then depending on the density of the grass you might benefit from grazing Um, I'm curious about this, like, ecological diversity, and uh, I live in a riparian zone, and we have, like, yew trees and dogwoods and hazel and hawthorn and all these beautiful trees, and we're in the process of clearing for fire safety, and uh, it feels to me like we're, like, destroying the ecological diversity and all the animal habitat, and I'm just curious about, like, how many of these bushes we can save, and when the riparian zone along a creek is like 100 feet from our house, like what we're supposed to be doing along that edge. Right. So whenever you modify an ecosystem, you're changing the habitat from one type to another. And within a riparian zone, you've got a little of an advantage because of the extra moisture that's held in that, in that ecosystem. 
So you have different kinds of plants that are more succulent, um, rushes, sedges, uh, alders, willows, they got their feet in the water. So you have a little more leeway. Um, one of the biggest problems we have in riparian areas is the Himalayan blackberry. It chokes out a lot of riparian areas, including choking out a lot of native plants. Um, and it, they burn like crazy because they just build up dead fuel year after year. So I would target mostly non-native plants, try to give the native plants a little more room to grow, thin them out, try to keep as many different kinds of native plants as you could. And I'm also curious, because we don't have one piece of poison oak on the whole 10 acres, and I'm like really worried about all this clearing and if it's just going to create the habitat for a poison oak to just... Yeah, that's a very good point. As you open up the forest, more sun gets in, there's more opportunity for different plants to move in. You've got to be especially vigilant uh, for the um, exotic invasive plants scotch broom that there's a little right. bit of and stuff. And so how do we stop those then from well, becoming dominant on the forest floor compared to these wonderful, diverse bushes? It takes a lot of work. And you can plant, you know, plant native plants where it's appropriate and just pull, cut, um, spray, whatever to, to control the unwanted uh, invasive vegetation. And what are these native plants? Oh, there's a whole long list of them. And you should um, maybe go to the Native Plant, the Nash, um, California Native Plant Society has a plant sale twice a year and um, in the fall and in the spring. And you should get in touch with them and look at your options. And you can buy a lot of these plants in containers and bring them home and plant them. Certain plants need more sun than others, and so you have to find the right place to plant them. And you may have an abundance of hazel, and if you take some hazel out, you may have an opportunity to put in a different plant that would like the extra sun. Those are some great questions. I think we're going to wrap up this section of questions and to move on to our next speaker. And our next speaker is Joanne Drummond. She's the director of the Nevada County Fire Safe Council. And she is um, nationally recognized for leading this community become, to become more fire wise and become more resilient to fire. So I'm excited uh, for her to share about her programming with you. Thank you. And I'm just going to let my PowerPoint kind of play in the background. I've got it on a little loop. It'll have some information about our programs and services. But I really wanted to talk to you a little bit today about um, the National Cohesive Strategy and kind of bringing in some of the elements that we've been talking about here today. Um, the Fire Safe Council is a volunteer-based nonprofit organization. Even though we have Nevada County in our name, we are no part of county government. So really, when we talk about volunteer-based organization, I'm talking about you. We're here to educate and motivate you to do more work on your property to make your home more fire resilient. Um, we have adopted the National Cohesive Wildland Fire Management Strategy which is a strategic push to work collaboratively to make uh, meaningful progress across all boundaries to create fire resilient landscapes, fire adapted communities, you can read firewise there, as well as a safe and effective wildfire response. Um, Dario talked a little bit about you know, active forest management. We've had a lot of opposition in California to cutting trees to the point that much of our infrastructure to manage things like the current bark beetle crisis um, have really kind of tied our hands. We don't have the kind of mills and facilities and even the kind of logging um, activities that we used to have. So partnering with agencies like the Tahoe National Forest, the Fire Safe Council works across the checkerboard pattern of ownership to create a healthier forest and a more fire resilient forest. So if you heard the little Hoover Commission report, I do have a synopsis of that on my table tonight that points out some of the deficiencies in terms of the active forest management and the unintended consequences in terms of the wildfire hazard. 
So, you know, many times logging was thinning the forest where natural fire used to do that for us. So when we ask you to manage this vegetation, we're really asking you to emulate the benefits of natural fire on the landscape. Fire would clear out that understory ladder fuels, but that's what we're asking you to do manually. So in many cases, um, like the Tahoe National Forest, we have brought in grant funding in partnership with them, and it really will pre-treat the forest to enable those professionals to go back at a later time and put natural fire or prescribed fire on the ground to help get rid of that accumulation of fuels so that we can have a healthier forest. Um, the bark beetle crisis really is a result of an overstocked forest coupled with the drought. Um, so those things really need to be addressed in a real cohesive fashion across property boundaries. Um, many of us have, have these imaginary lines. We don't want to look at our neighbors. But fire does not respect these imaginary lines that we put on the ground. It is going to follow the fuel. So if you don't like looking at your neighbor, look at that screening and think of it as a fire wick or fuse that is going to connect your two homes and potentially have damaging consequences for both of you. So on to the second leg of the national cohesive strategy, which is creating fire adapted communities. This is much what Steve and Franz have talked about tonight. You chose to live in the forest and yet you don't maybe really recognize the threat that is in front of you. So having a lifestyle of being firewise is really the key here. You know, clearing your defensible space once a year is probably really not enough. We are almost facing a year-round fire season. We had a great little, you know, warm weather patch here just a little while ago and flowers were blooming and fuels were drying. Um, we haven't had a lot of rain this year, so we may be headed for another drought. Fire season has been proven to be longer, so we have a longer duration of exposure to that. So really using the National Fire Protections Model, the Fire Safe Council has moved beyond individual defensible space of 100 feet and tried to get you to work across these property boundaries in a more cohesive fashion and looking at the topography, looking at the fuels, and looking at how fire is going to behave in your community to try to enable you to look at that problem and solve it in a real proactive manner. We want to be able to focus your energy in a good way. A lot of you are out there working hard to make this happen, and yet sometimes you don't really recognize some of the biggest hazards that you may see or we may see if we came out to your house. So we do have a sign up out there on the table if you are interested in having a qualified trained volunteer from the Fire Safe Council, one of your FireWise neighbors come out and give you a fresh perspective. Uh, many of you stack your wood on your deck this time of year. Probably okay this time of year, um, but you know, really the law tells you it needs to be 30 feet away from your structure. So it's these little things that you're doing around your home that you just don't really recognize can pose likely the biggest threat to your structure in a wildfire event, as we've seen from Steve's videos, it's really that ember intrusion. So it's about the maintenance. Everyone will tell me, oh, I'm done. I got my defensible space. Not true. You got to be checking it probably every month. What do those valleys on your roof look like? You know, did, did somebody put a pine cone basket at the holidays on your deck? You know, that can't stay there during fire season. So sometimes you just don't notice these little things, but if you had someone come out to your house with a fresh perspective, they could help you see those things. So really it's about that maintenance of the fine fuels, what you put next to your house, but it may have the biggest impact on whether your home will burn in a wildfire event. So finally, the last leg of the stool is a safe and effective fire suppression response. There are hundreds of fires that happen in the CAL FIRE unit here in the wildland that most of you never even hear about. Unless you saw planes fly over and, and, and people responding to it right in your neighborhood, they are really good at what they do. And hand it out to them, I mean, they do an amazing job when sometimes you guys don't give them a lot to work with. You know, they have to make tough choices in those wildfires as to whether they can safely deploy and defend your home. And that's only that one day a year when the fire happens. 
But the other 364 days a year, you have the choice on how you maintain your home and whether it's accessible to firefighting equipment. So here back in October, you know, we had some pretty extreme fire behavior, red flag warning events. Those are high wind events that will propagate fire pretty aggressively. And when those warnings are given by the weather service, the fire department staffs up because they know that if something gets started, they're going to be chasing it. So these were the same conditions, the fall phone winds, similar to the Santa Ana winds in Southern California. It's a weather pattern that sets up every fall, and we're going to get those winds repeatedly. So it's on the news, right? Be extra careful in what you're doing around your house because people are predominantly the cause of fires. So when we have those kind of events, we need to recognize that it's going to be very difficult to catch. We're going to be waiting for a change in the weather. But everything that Fire Safe Council is asking you to do is for the normal weather conditions. And the science shows that your home has about an 80% chance of surviving a fire if you have good defensible space. But more importantly, it's going to allow firefighters a safe working environment to help protect your home. So that's critical. The other thing in Nevada County, we have 60 to 70 percent private roads. And I hear from every one of you that somebody on the road won't cut back their vegetation and it creates a fire tunnel for the rest of you. So this safe and effective wildfire response also includes emergency evacuation. So you can imagine them trying to move in big equipment while you're trying to get out. Okay, so many people here in Rough and Ready and the McCourtney Fire saw, you know, firsthand what it's like when those phone winds are blowing and we're under that catastrophic condition. It was the same condition during the 49er Fire in 1988. I often tell people that the Fire Safe Council was birthed from the ashes of the 49er Fire. It took us about 10 years to really get organized, but our community found it simply unacceptable that 33,000 acres and 312 structures burned in four days. We were really lucky last time, last October. Only 29 homes. Luckily, the wind changed and it didn't hit Lake Wildwood. So we only have, you know, those winds for a short amount of time, but we have all year to prepare for them. So we need to understand what each of us does not only protects our home, but it also affects the people next to us. So what you're not doing affects them as well. So that really is that cohesive strategy that we're in this together. Fire will follow the fuels. It is not going to stop at your property boundary unless you've got bare mineral soil and it simply has no fuel to burn. So are you ready to evacuate? I don't think so. Last February, Oroville Dam disaster, like 200,000 people running for their lives. I thought, okay, you guys are going to wake up and get a kit, and you're going to be ready. Not. Okay? We had people call in our office after the evacuation warnings went out in October, and you're just really not prepared to leave your house in five or ten minutes. We have a great evacuation guide. We work with CAL FIRE, the Forest Service, the Sheriff's Department, uh, John at the Office of Emergency Services. We try to put the best information that we have. We learned some lessons in October that will be added to this year's guide, but it takes you taking personal responsibility to have pet carriers, to have a plan, share a key with a trusted neighbor in case you're at work when this fire breaks out. Because it is not a matter of if a wildfire will occur in Nevada County, it's when and where it will happen and if you are really ready for your home to stand alone. That's our goal, is that your home would stand alone in a wildfire event because we know that these guys have their hands full trying to put the fire out and getting people out of the way. That's their first priority is life. Your property can be replaced. Your life cannot and neither can theirs. So do your part. Get some defensible space. Do what you can to harden your structure and talk to your neighbors. Tell them about your true concerns about your road 
or the fuel that's screening them from you and try to work together to really be safe. So we're in the lobby if you have any questions. And thank you, because I see a lot of Firewise people out here. I know I'm preaching to the choir a little bit. Uh, we need to drag some of those neighbors in or take them out for a cocktail and, and get, them, get them lubed up to uh, receive our message. So thank you very much for coming tonight and look forward to working with you. Thank you, Joanne. That was great to learn about the programs here in Nevada County and the types of activities that we can partake as residents. We have a few questions. This is for Joanne. Uh, Joanne, you mentioned that uh, the code right now is 30 feet flat land, 100 feet on a slope. What is a science uh, recommendation on that? I think we might have gotten that a little wrong. There are two zones for defensible space, the first 30 feet being more intense management with a reduced fuel zone from 30 to 100 feet. So that is the, the basic requirement under California Public Resource Code. If you're on a slope, you're going to need more defensible space because fire travels much quicker uphill. I was comparing the California state law with the National Fire Protection Association's FireWise program, which may be considered the best available science. So within 30 feet of your home, the California law says 10 feet of crown separation in your trees, whereas FireWise recommends 18. So that's nearly double. I would be happy if we could get anywhere between 10 and 18. But as many of you know, looking at some of these pictures here tonight, we don't have that kind of you know, clearance around our structures. One more question. Um, if whining and dining are reluctant neighbors doesn't work, uh, is there another option through uh, county codes or the fire department? or What else can we do? Worst case scenario. Well, you know, you should reach out to your agency partners, whether it's your local fire district on the hazardous vegetation management ordinance. That's a local ordinance that the County Board of Supervisors passed a couple of years ago to provide defensible space for all across property boundaries. So if you're faced with one of those situations, you would contact your local fire department to work with them. Um, if it's a neighbor that is within 100 feet and maybe they don't have their defensible space, you could contact your local CAL FIRE representative to see if you couldn't educate them and motivate them to get um, better clearance. Hi there. Thank you for your, the whole panel has been very informative. Um, I have two questions. You made reference to an evacuation guide. I'm assuming what you're referencing is different from this since this is produced by CAL FIRE, or is this what you were? Oh, that. Okay. So it's this newspaper thing. Yeah. Okay. Our newspaper one is based on the National and CAL FIRE's Ready, Set, Go program, but we customized it with local information right. like Pascal at Ubinet over here. Pascal and Susan do an amazing job with fire information when there's something going on. Um, during fire events, she'll even have a blog to coordinate places to put animals and things. Um, KVMR is our local emergency broadcast station. So it's kind of that same template with current information for our community. So okay. um, just I a little more pertinent, I think. Great. And I, I'm very familiar with uh, Ubinet and KVMR, and they've been incredible. And we have supported them because they give us an incredible gift. So I want to advocate for that. The, the other question that I had uh, more specifically about the neighbors, in our, we're on Banner Mountain, and we have a property next to us which is unoccupied. Somebody owns it, but we don't know who it is, and it's thicker than ours. We've done a lot of work over the years. We have a lot to go, but next door to us, in front of us, all around us, other people aren't doing it. And for the property people that we don't know, what can we do in terms of addressing that issue when we don't know who the landowner is and it's not occupied? Unfortunately, there is not a code or ordinance that requires landscape forest management. Um, unless they're, you know, inhibiting your defensible space, um, there is no policy. But I will say that the FireWise communities um, have been very successful in 
contacting those landowners and motivating them, showing them pictures of the property and expressing a true concern about the hazard that is adjacent to them. It is not successful 100% of the time, but I would think more than 50% of the time those FireWise communities have been able to get action. So it is a constant process of you know working together and even providing some resources. FireWise communities are eligible for AmeriCorps crews if they have a project in their action plan. And so the Fire Safe Council does provide resources to enable that work to get done at a very low cost but it does require a neighborhood that's cooperating so that we know we have more cohesive fuels treatment across the landscape and just addressing some of the problem areas, particularly as it threatens homes and lives. Okay, and now I'd like to open up the questions to the full panel after you've heard the information from Dr. Steve Quarles and Franz and Dario and Joanne. I think you probably have a better overall understanding of how we can move forward together as a community. And so now, are there any kind of more overall big, pic big picture questions for our panel? Um, Doria, I think the forest, or the forest, we have uh, around our property um, our fair share of Manzanita. And I've heard a lot of bad things, and I've read good things about Manzanita. I, I personally think it's a beautiful tree, plant. Um, comments, I've, I've thinned it out, I've, you know, I just have really tall manzanita now, so there's no ladder fuel to jump them. Is that the best I can do, or should I just get rid of them? No, manzanita is not inherently more flammable than anything else. Um, it sometimes just gets so thick with all the dead material under it that it can go up in a real hot fire. So I think what sounds like you've done is, is what you should do. And a lot of people thin it out, cut out the dead, leave the most um, artistic looking shaped bushes and try to have a little separation between them. And I wouldn't have it right up next to my house, but out of the ways, it's, it's a beautiful plant. Um, oak tree management, those are different trees than the pine forest that you've been showing. Um, what are the recommendations for separating those or cutting them up from the ground or uh, how, how would you manage the oak trees? Yes, yeah, so um, there are different species of oaks that we have and the Oaks that hold their leaves year round, the live oaks, tend to be more flammable. And those would be the ones I would try to prune up, thin out a little more than the deciduous oaks. One of the biggest problems we have in some of the black oak forests is an understory developing of incense cedar, very shade tolerant, and it'll eventually just grow its way right up to the top of the canopy. Those incense cedars are highly flammable, uh, especially with branches all the way to the ground. So um, I'm not as concerned about a deciduous oak forest if there's no ladder fuels. The ground fuels tend to be less flammable, less burn less hot than the conifer fuels. Um, there's less oil in the material. So mostly it's the ladder fuels I'd be concerned about. I wonder if you can tell me a little more about Code Red. Um, is that simply for evacuations, or is that maybe an early warning system talking about conditions that might be so, dangerous? <clears throat> Code Red is an uh, emergency mass notification system. And so right now we have Code Red. If you have an AT&T hard line at your house, you'll get a call. But most people don't have AT&T if they even have a hard line, so most of us have cell phone. So what we want you to do is register your cell phone with Code Red. And what that does, we'll do emergency alerts to notify you that there's something going on. Um, and generally, it could be from a lost person, and that doesn't happen too often, but generally it's, there's a fire near you, you need to evacuate or be aware of it. And we'll do a, an immediate evacuation notice and then an advisory. Those are the only two notices we're gonna have now. 
on the evacuation language has changed. There's no such thing as a mandatory evacuation. I'm just telling you, though, if you're asked to evacuate, do evacuate. Too many people are dying because we're not going to evacuate, and we really do need to evacuate. Um, so it'll contact your cell phones April 1st. Most people won't have to register anymore because we're assigned an MOU with FEMA, but we still like folks to register because if you're not in the area, you can hear something's going on in your area. Is that good enough explanation? Yeah, it's just uh, you can register as many phones as you want, and that's what we encourage folks to do. If you have relatives that live outside the area, they can register. Uh, you can have, register their phones, so that way they can get a call if something's going on here. I don't know about it. A lot of people do that with uh, their kids that live in L.A. or something like that. Thank you all so much for coming this evening and asking such wonderful questions and sharing such rich information. Um, all of that is much appreciated. We're getting ready to um, transition into the next phase of this workshop. And so before we do that, I want to introduce the people who have booths out in the lobby um, that are going to be sharing their technical and cost share information with you. So if they could come on up. Hi, I'm Sabrina Nicholson. I'm the district manager for the Nevada County Resource Conservation District. We are a special district, so even though it says Nevada County, we're not a county entity. We're not a nonprofit, but what we will do is provide technical assistance and education to you on natural resource conservation on your property. So if you have erosion control issues or pond management or tree fire management, any of those things, if you go online to our website, what we'll do is you fill out a form, comes to me, I'll have our consultant contact you within two days, and we'll set up a time for him to come out to your property and work on these concerns with you. Is that no cost to the landowner? Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Pamela Hertzler. I'm with the United States Department of Agriculture. My agency is NRCS, or Natural Conservation Service Agency. I see a lot of faces in the room that I have met, and I've probably spoken to quite a few of you on the telephone. What our agency does is we work with the landowner on your natural resources. In this particular case, forestry is the topic of the evening. And so we go out there with technical assistance also, and hopefully we could get you some cost share funding to help you with your tree removals, your limbing, your pruning, your cleanup, your mastication. We do not pay for 100%, but it's more of a helping hand. And being that we are a federal agency, we do need information from you to be able to uh, uh, make you eligible for our programs. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Robert Canapa with the United States Department of Agriculture Rural Development Agency. I work out of Auburn. I cover Nevada County. I'm here tonight to discuss some homeowner assistance programs that we have for some uh, lower income based people. Um, we may be able to take out some trees or do some uh, stuff around the house that's health and safety related. Good evening, I'm Cynthia Haynes from PG&E. And this evening I'm here with my colleague, Peter Beasley. And um, I wanted to thank Joanne and Kate for putting this amazing program together and the panel of experts. I've learned so much tonight. Um, PG&E offers natural gas and electric safety training and 811 safety digging classes for free to homeowners associations or any groups or community organizations community organizations that may be looking for a guest speaker. Um, my job is, is primarily to teach natural gas and electric safety training to first responders, but we have extended all the classes out to the community at large. So if you would like classes, please call me. In addition to that, um, Peter, my colleague here, is a vegetation management expert. So all of you that have your concerns about trees or um, things that are going on in your property that have to do with PG&E. We'd like to hear your questions, comments, or concerns this evening. Our booth is a little bit behind the door here, but we'd certainly like to hear from you. And thank you again for including us in this, um, this evening's event. It's pretty impressive. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mary Eldridge. I'm Public Information Officer for CAL FIRE in the NEU unit, and I represent these gentlemen that you see in the back, and I appreciate Chief Wallen being here, and Steve Garcia is a forester, uh, too, and we also, well, you live here. Everybody knows you, right? No, maybe not so much. So thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> I, we, we, 
they do the work of, of teaching defensible space every day. And so I come out and I have a booth and I have some written literature there. And we encourage you to read through that literature and try to make some changes. And I remember telling a story about how firefighters do this every day. And I think of it as like musical chairs. So you start out, you got five people, you got five chairs, you go around, the music's playing and everything is good. And then we realize that maybe something's missing out of our kit like Joanne was talking about. And we realize someone just swiped a chair and the music's about to stop. Well, these guys work on building chairs every day. Every day they've got more than enough chairs so that when the music stops, they know how to respond. And so I'm trying to help you build chairs so that when the music stops, everybody in your family has a place to sit down. And some of it's in that literature that's out there, and some of it is in their wisdom and their experience that they've had for decades. And some of it can be found on an app. We do have the Ready for Wildfire app. You can go and you can go to blogs and Facebook posts and Twitter feeds and get that information and learn and be aware. Just be aware. And if you can know your neighbor and knock on the door and ask them about their defensible space, if you can start a fire safe council, fire alliance, if you can do that work, it really gives you more self-confidence. It makes you feel better. And if we cannot be afraid, not be scared, then that's a step in the right direction. And for some people, it starts with mowing the lawn. Yeah. All right, so I've got more literature out on the table, including coloring books, and grown-ups can color in them too. Thank you all so much. And I really would just like again to thank the panel uh, for coming this evening and sharing their wisdom. And I also want to thank um, Joanne Drummond of the Fire Safe Council and Sabrina Nicholson and Pam Hertzler of the RCD and the NRCS for actually um, embracing me as a new employee in this region and as a new position and helping me put on such a collaborative event for this community. So just a big thank you to everyone who is here tonight. Okay, and now I look forward to interacting with all of you out in the lobby. We have some fantastic food sponsored by the University of California and also wonderful education uh, material from all of the people you met here this evening.